Let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you this amazing day, a day that you have made, a day that we will rejoice and be glad in. We thank you for every person here. We thank you, Lord. We come with eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to receive your word. Therefore, we're thanking that you have sent the Holy Spirit to cause your word to come alive in each and every one of us. Speak to us, minister to us, give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation, and we'll give you all the praise, honor, and glory, Lord Jesus. And everyone said, amen. And it's important that, that you realize that 35 years ago, something began to stir in Pastor Art there in uh, Makiki, a small little apartment. You know, we were married, Kun and I, and yet we didn't have any children, but we were well on our way. We had many victories from place to place that we went, and we went in many places, believe me. And um, one of the first victories that we had is they said our first daughter was going to die and uh, was going to be stillborn or we were going to have to. Um, and we, we remember Kuhn and I just getting started in the ministry and we had to stand our ground. And of course, Ashley was born and she's, a, as far as I'm concerned, she's our miracle child. Amen. Every one of my children are miracle children. Amen. So as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, when we talk about taking the city, we're talking about winning the city. I remember praying over our city. I remember praying, um, you know, you know, in some, some, I won't even go there as to where they were, these, um, these apartments and just re looking out over the city because there was nothing to look at in our room because the only furniture we had at the time was cardboard boxes, literally. We didn't have any furniture for years. And um, except whatever we can find on the streets. No, not that bad, but it was, it was close. And, um, but we're talking about not taking the city in some kind of a, uh, aggressive, pompous kind of way, but we're talking about winning souls and making disciples. And even though we started something back then, there was something stirring that I quite didn't, quite didn't put together to many years after the ministry. And um, the first word that God gave me as I was reading his word, as he was beginning to work in my life and give me direction, I was well on my way to becoming an architect and yet I remember one afternoon there in Makiki on a Saturday, and I was praying, I was interceding, and I was just, just kind of, you know, kind of uh, just with the Lord. He spoke to me out of, um, out of uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 16, and he said, he told me to hold forth the word of life, you know, and uh, to a crooked and perverse generation. That's the first word. The second word he gave me that same afternoon is he says, go and stand in, in the midst of the temple and speak all the words of this life. And both the words life were speaking to me. Of course, word of life, if you don't know this biblically in 1 John, is a reference to Jesus Christ. Well, the first reference, holding forth the word of life, is a reference of preaching the gospel beyond where you're at. Holding forth, like going forth and preaching the gospel. So I know it was to a world. But then the second one is kind of what anchored my pastorship. And he says, go and stand in the midst of the temple and speak all the words of this life. So in essence, though I didn't really put it together back then, he was asking me to go and win souls or go and evangelize. But at the same time in the church, speak to the people that you want all the words of his life, this life. And so that is, uh, in a nutshell, you know how God started me. But I knew one thing. I knew that the vision that we had was redemptive. In other words, I was so excited because of what I knew God can do in a person's life for what he had done in my life and those lives of, of other Christians that I've seen turn around. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, no redemptive revelation, people perish. How many know God doesn't want anybody to perish? Of course, I'm not just talking about, yes, I, though I am, first and foremost, about people perishing for never receiving Christ Jesus. But Jesus came for the perishing man. Not only those of us who did not know him or do not know him, because all of us in this room at one time were in the category of perishing in that we didn't know him. We might have had religion. We might have had spirituality. We might have had interests. And we might have even been good people. But it wasn't until you're born again that you have life, right? But there's many other forms of perishing, and I'll get to that later on. But let me uh, begin by giving you some insight of where I'll come back toward the end. 
You know, there's little insights in the gospel, in the Bible, that from the time that Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden, it was 6,000 years until Jesus rose from the dead. But through the prophets and through the patriarchs of the Bible, you begin to read, whether it's Psalms or the other uh, patriarchs, little glimpses of what the Messiah is going to do when he comes to rectify, you know, humanity's fall. And so this is one of those glimpses, even though Job is going through his situation, which God did not cause, but nevertheless, it was Satan. But nevertheless, he at one point speaks as he's reflecting back on his life. You know, there he's sitting with boils and he's sitting with a situation. And, um, but he makes this statement. I'll, I'm going to read it and then I'll come back. Job, remembering, he says this. Because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless, and the one who had no helper. The blessing of a perishing man came upon me. And I caused the widow's heart to sing with joy. I put on righteousness, God's way of doing and being right. And it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. Verse 15. I was eyes to the blind, and I was feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor. I searched out the case that I did not know. I broke the fangs of the wicked, and I plucked the victim from its teeth, rescued. I want you to, but we'll come back to that in just a second. I want us to be stirred by the Holy Spirit and his word this morning to this amazing life that we have. Jude called it, we read it last week, our amazing salvation that we all participate in. And, and yet, it's important that you know that no matter where we come from, no matter who you are, whatever station in life, cultural background, tradition, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now the word saved doesn't just mean just getting into heaven. And I want to explain that for a second. But it says here, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Being saved means that you and I have the right to possess what Jude said, an amazing salvation. Say amazing salvation. Being saved means to be transformed from the inside out. Being transformed in your heart. Giving whosoever, you, me, they, them, whatever nation, whatever tongue, whatever tribe, whatever country, giving whosoever complete new life. Bible says it will become a new creation in Christ Jesus, old things passed away. Bible says that we become children of God. We become king's kids, if I can use that, or citizens of the kingdom of God. And the list goes on and on and on. But what you might not know is that being saved gives you the divine, the right to live the divine life on this side of glory. What I mean by on this side of you leaving this earth, on this side before you go to heaven. Now what I'm about to share with you will be absolutely biblical, but I hope it disturbs you. That's what I like to do. I like to help the disturb and disturb the comfortable. Anyways, but there, it's important that you and I understand the new life that you have in Christ is a divine life. There used to be an old song in charismatic, certain church circles. Say, I have a new way of living. I have a new life divine. I have the fruit of the spirit. I'm abiding, abiding in the vine. Abiding in the vine, abiding in the vine. Love, joy, peace, health. He has made the mind. And it goes on to say, isn't that great? I can do that without music. Anyways, um, but uh, yeah, no, I won't do it again. Anyways, um, but this new life divine is on this side of glory. Being saved gives you two primary respond, well, two primary characteristics to really, really consider. 
right and responsibility. Right and responsibility. Let, let me remind you of something that is true before I go there. Decisions determine your destiny. And you can never go any further than the depth of the decisions that you personally make. Decisions are personal choices. You might say you can't, but you're wrong, 100% wrong. You can make decisions. A decision is the seed for the birth of conviction. If you want to live by conviction, you must make a decision on any, on any matter. Marriage, how far your marriage is going to go. Parenting, finance, your walk with the Lord. The basic principle is your decisions, remember, will determine your destiny. And in other words, what I'm saying to you is you'll never possess conviction beyond the quality of decision that you're personally willing to make in your life. It's also true that when um, it comes to the gospel or the promises of God, the quality of your conviction, its strength, its depth, um, will never go beyond the decision you're willing to make. A great evangelist once said, the first step to a life of excellence is dedication. And true dedication is a decision of quality. A decision of quality is a decision where there is no turning back, there is no retreat, there is no going back, and there is no quit in it. These decisions have to be made in your life have to be made. Without this decision, you'll never live by conviction. You'll never even know what it is. Most people remain double-minded. And the, James said, a double-minded man is up and down and unstable in all of his life. And let him not think he will receive anything of the Lord, whether it's healing or a great marriage or a great life or all these things that you can clearly see are promised to you in the Bible. How do I get conviction? You start with the seed of decision. But here I, I move on because that's a general statement. True dedication simply makes a decision based on one's commitment to God or God's word. Because you cannot make a commitment to God without making a commitment to God's word. It does, that, that statement doesn't exist. Well, well, I'm committed to God, but I don't want to follow. That's, then you're not committed. So I move on. It says, and it's not based on feelings, emotions, or circumstances. There, now, there's two decisions I want to talk to you about this morning. Ooh, listen faster, please. The first one is I heard in my prayer study time. And what I heard is today, it just came out of my spirit after praying in the spirit for a while. Today I decide to decide to live by decision by the right and by the responsibility of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. just kind of came out of me. Today I decide to decide to live by decision, by the right and by the responsibility of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today I decide to decide to live by decision. Today I decide to decide. Have you ever noticed that all kinds of things are always trying to make up your decisions for you? Well, yeah, you made that decision, but you're not feeling too good today. Oh, you made a decision, but yeah, but you just broke up with so-and-so. Yeah, you made a decision to prosper. Didn't they just let you go? Yeah, 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 you go on. You have to learn to make a quality decision that leads you to dedication, that has the, the Holy Spirit conviction. When you decide to decide to live by a decision, I'm telling you, my friends, it takes you farther than you can ever imagine. And some of you will never go as far 
is deep down inside your imagination because you're never willing to make the decision. Whether it's to live without sin, to live holy, to live pure, to live according to the word, to serve him all out. Well, let me help you. I'm still speaking in general principle. So that I share with you. Now, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, let me give you an example. Paul the Apostle says this. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Not to just some people, but to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek means it leaves out no one. Everyone read that out loud with me. Ready? Read. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, which simply means to everybody. This is, most people say, well, you know, Paul the Apostle just had that special, you know, had that special, you know, magic dust on him or, you know, God just kind of touched him and, he, and God did. But it's because, you know, most of what you read did not start in Paul's life for about 15 years after he was born again. Most of what you guys read or what we read. But he said it's a decision to not be ashamed of the gospel. Some Christians are ashamed of the gospel and so they never speak up for their, what they call a savior. But it's more their insurance policy. Hmm. But the point I'm trying to share with you is, you have the right and the responsibility to live on this side of glory Beyond your reason and logic and circumstance and feelings. It has nothing to do with how you feel, what people say, where you were born, or what is currently going on in your life right now. Nothing. The only thing that will turn that around it's when you make a decision, because until that seed of decision is made, the Holy Spirit has nothing to work with to bring you conviction. But the conviction, even as Paul the Apostle had, it will be tested, not by God, but it will be tested by the adversary to see if you have any worth in the salt you say you have. You want to be a light? All right. The enemy says. But I'm here to tell you there's nothing to fear. Because greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. Come on, somebody. But you have the biblical right and responsibility to partake the right, brother and sister. I don't care whether you came here and I don't know about this church. I'm just sitting here for the first time. Well, you better listen because the Holy Ghost brought you here. You have a right to partake in everything that Jesus shed his blood on the cross of Calvary and sealed through his resurrection to give you. Most people never make a decision. Therefore, they don't live by conviction and they never see the fruit of what they think they have. As an intention. The biblical right and responsibility to partake in the divine life on this side of glory is number one, the right for ourselves, and number two, the responsibility for others. Okay, let me explain the right for ourselves. Second Peter chapter two. I was so excited about this, I had to show you on the screens. It says, Simon Peter, a bond servant. And apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us. In other words, he's talking to the born again believer. Not a class of person, but every born again believer. Everyone. Say, that includes me. And he says this. By the righteousness of God. By the righteousness of our God. Now the Bible says in Isaiah 64 that our righteousness is as filthy rags. 
But it also says in 2 Corinthians 5.21 in the New Testament that we have been made to be his righteousness. He made us. He who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin for us so that we might be made to be his righteousness. Righteousness is what he did. Not what we do, but what we do is we receive what he did. All right? And I just want you to know, righteousness does not come from good works, but from our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can I have an amen? amen. Next verse. It goes on to say, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. As, verse 3 says, His divine power. Say divine power. Divine say it again. And I put there in brackets, that's what happened when you were born again or at the new birth. Something happened when you were born again. It's not what you felt. You may have had shed a tear, that's fine. You may have been emotional, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and, and that could, as, you know, can be the outcome. But he says, his divine power at the new birth has given to us something he alone can do gave you something, has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now watch this. Moving on. It says, His divine power came through the knowledge of Him, meaning knowing that Jesus is Savior and Lord, who called us by glory and virtue, verse 4, by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises. For clarity, I put there divine promises. Say divine promises. How I many you know all the promises are divine? In other words, they're God-given. All the Bible promises are not made by men or committees or groups or specialists in some kind of little factory somewhere up high in the Himalayas somewhere. All right? These are God-given. Say divine promises. Now watch. There's divine power that was given to us, and this divine power has made available what you did not have before called divine promises. Whether it's healing, whether it's marriage, whether it's a sound mind, it doesn't make a difference what the world says about your body. It's what God has said in his word about your body. Hmm. The only one who has access to these divine promises Promises are those who have partaken in the divine power. That being said, it says, his divine promises, that through these divine promises, now it goes on, you may be partakers of the divine nature. Say divine life. <sighs> Peter is saying, do you folks know what's going on here? Your amazing salvation is because of his divine power that gave you divine promises that gives you the right the right the right the legal right that Satan himself cannot stop that religion will try to stop that your mind will argue with but has given you the right to live on this side of going to heaven. The divine life, or it says here, the divine nature, I refer to as divine life. It's what gives you the power to escape the corruption, the twistedness of the one in which we live. Ah, oh, Pastor, I, I, I don't know about that. Shut that unbelief up. That is all that's talking right now. You said, I'm offended. You need to get offended and get healed from your offense. Because you're trying to coddle, you try to coddle sin and coddle sickness and coddle everything that Jesus came to destroy. Tell me how you're acting on his divine power, his divine promise, and his divine life. Where do you find in the Bible that he authored sickness, disease, oppression, depression? Everything that Christians love to coddle. Excuses and weakness. 
Oh, we love those things because we want to blend in. You were never called to blend in. You were always called to stand out with his divine power, his divine promises, and his divine life. Come on, somebody get excited. The divine life is a transformed life. It's the uncommon life. Last week, I, I, I talked to you about Acts chapter 11, verse 9. Again, Peter, St. Peter, El Pedro. He says, but a voice answered me again from heaven. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. What God has cleansed. When you're born again, you're not born again because you've gone to church long enough. Or because you've done everything right long enough. Or because today you didn't kick the cat. Or you didn't argue with your spouse. That's all work-based Religiosity. We said uh, that when you think about a common man, he says, he says what God has cleansed through his blood, through his cross, through his resurrection. You now have been marked. You've got to make a decision on the divine life, the divine power, and the divine promises. And now you have to make another decision Am I or am I not going to believe the Bible? You want to be ordinary? You want to live like the world? Go ahead. You're doing it anyway. Well, I don't want to. I just don't know. Make your mind up. Make a decision so you can get some backbone called conviction. Or this world, this world will take you out, brother and sister. You cannot live with one foot in the world and one foot in, in Jesus and expect to live through it. You will not live through it. You will not live through it. It's just a matter of time before they set you up to have a great fall down. Whether you do it in secret or it's done openly. But the enemy is tactical. He's defeated. He doesn't have power over you. So you better use the power you have over him to enforce his already defeated influence but it says what God has cleansed you must not call common you are not common to be common means to be ordinary or or typical or simple undistinguished and unheralded unrecognized and uncelebrated without greatness and without uniqueness my gosh think about what you say sometimes without even thinking about it how could you be without greatness when the greater one lives on the inside of you how could you possibly imagine yours, except if you did not yet make a decision? you got to decide to see yourself according to the Word of God. You've got to decide that I'm not going to see myself according to how I feel. I'm going to govern how I feel with His Word, and His Word is going to shift my feelings, but I'm going to live by this Word because this Word is eternal and my feelings are temporal. This decision will get you on a launching pad because you now become uncommon, not weird, not strange. You see, and this makes all the difference in how you read the Bible. If you don't see yourself through how Jesus sees you, you'll never, you'll never read the Bible the way it's supposed to be read. You'll always read it as a victim. Oh, it's me. And Jesus, when are you going to heal my body? And Jesus, when are you going to rescue me? What did, he, what did he do at the cross of Calvary? Well, I'm not feeling it. That's just your feelings. You don't want to take authority over your feelings? You're going to, go, you're going to feel your way right into hell. Right into defeat. You can't say that. Yes, I can, and I did, and I'll say it again. Because... If you don't stop where you're going, you'll keep going till you're stopped. Now, for the others, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, now because you are who you are in Christ Jesus, through his blood, through the cross, through his resurrection, Jesus is the only one who gets glory. You got that? Because of what he's done, 
you have a responsibility in the gospel for others. By which you and I, you and I will stand judgment. You might want to put it off. You might not want to believe it. It makes no difference. You will stand before God and he will ask you what you did with everything he invested into your life. Well, I just sat in church and just, I don't know. I really didn't think I could do any of that. Because you didn't read your Bible. You're listening to garbage. Religious garbage. For your very lives are a letter that anyone can read by just looking at you. Christ himself wrote it. Not with ink. But with God's living spirit. Not chiseled into stone, but carved into human lives, referring to your heart. You see, there is a power that works in you, that works for you, and works for others. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto him who by the action of his power, remember that power we read about in the book of Peter, his divine power, that is at work in us, is able to carry out his purpose to do super abundantly over and above all that we dare ask or think. What's the purpose? What did Jesus come to do? The Bible says, for this purpose the Son of God was made manifest, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, that he, Jesus, might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus said, as I... As my Father has sent me, so I send you. Many other places he said that, but I'll give you this reference. <clears throat> that was John 20, 21. John 14 says, And these works shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do. Everywhere Jesus walked for three and a half years, he was destroying the works. That ultimately, he was the redemption of mankind. But the Bible says that you and I now have divine power with divine promises to live out this divine nature. You cannot measure your life here on earth by how you were born into this earth apart from being born again. Your purpose is to also destroy the works of the devil. Wait, 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 what are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Jesus said, those that believe upon me in my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall lay hands on the sick, and the sick will what? I mean, that's just two right there. Well, I don't know if I can do that. Well, then you don't, you've not made a decision about your divine life. But whether you do or whether you don't, one day you will stand before Jesus and he will ask you what you did about the perishing man. He will ask us, not you just you here, us the church. He will ask you what you did with this uncommon life. I cleansed you by my blood. I set you free through my cross. I gave you resurrection power. You often quoted me, greater is he that's in me than he is in the world. You often said, out of Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What did you do? Well, you know, I, I kind of sat in church and twiddle my thumbs because, you know, I just want to be fed all the time. You have the right to walk in the power of God, but you have the responsibility to reach out to the perishing man. And the perishing man, if you want to know who he is, look at yourself before you were born again. It's not about how much money they have and what car they drive and what neighborhood they live in. It's any person who's been afflicted by the devil. The Bible says in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, that although the enemy has ability, you have authority in Jesus over the enemy's ability. The enemy is an outlaw. He's a thief who comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. If you don't enforce him when he tries to come against you, which you have the right in the name of Jesus to do, he won't go anywhere. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. You following me? And we have the responsibility because the heart of the Father 
expressed through the Son was to reach out to an archipelago who was perishing and had no regard for God Almighty. Religious, but no regard. Went to church on Sunday for almost 25 years. No regard, no desire, no regard. Lost as a goose in a snowstorm, whatever that's supposed to mean. But here's what I want you to understand. Rescuing the perishing man is what you and I are responsible for. Winning souls, making disciples, but also demonstrating the name of Jesus, the power of God. Laying hands on the sick, casting out devils if need to. And there's a need to. It's not always just a problem. Hmm. Otherwise, my friends, <clears throat> well, we'll stand with a responsibility. And yet the Bible says in Proverbs 24, verse 11, it says, rescue the perishing man. Don't hesitate to step in and help. If you say, hey, that was none of my business, will that get you off the hook? Someone is watching you closely. You know, someone who's not impressed with weak excuses. Just in case you want to read that, that's Proverbs 24, verse 11 and 12. It doesn't really motivate people to read that. But here's what I want you to understand. When Job said... Because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless, and the one who had no helper. How many are in your workplace, your universities? Wherever you won't go, the perishing man is. But there's something that God does with those that reach out to the perishing man. So Job is remembering about this perishing man, the afflicted man. The tormented man, the diseased man, and that's not gender specific. In the kingdom of heaven, there's neither, you know, married or not married, and, and neither, neither gender. But I want you to see it says, and this is an insight to the coming Messiah. Because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless, and those who had no helper, the blessing of a perishing man came upon me. In other words, he's saying, I noticed that God would empower and bless me. To bless means power to prosper, anointed to win, possible to be cursed. Amen? Well, amen to Pastor Art, from Pastor Art. The blessing of a perishing man came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness, God's way of doing and being right, and it clothed me. In other words, I lived this way, and it was like I was dressed this way all the time. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind who was perishing. I was feet to the lame who was perishing. I was a father to the poor who was perishing. I searched out for the case that I did not know. I broke the fangs of the wicked. I plucked the victim from his teeth. He became the rescuer of the perishing. A glimpse of what Jesus came to do. A glimpse of what Jesus said you and I are to do here today, 2019. See, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. Everyone, everyone, everyone has a responsibility to exercise God's word, not based on feelings or emotions. Because before you were, let's just say saved, you were perishing. Maybe lost in confusion. And only God knew what was going on inside of you. Only God knew your affliction. And you and I, we walk and we walk and we walk and we see and we go and we work and we play and we do all these wonderful things. There's nothing wrong with that, but perishing are all among us. And because we in our emotions don't see or understand what's going on, only God knows the afflictions of the devil that some people hide so well and so deep. 
but are so tormented and cannot sleep. God knows, and that's why he says, obey my word, because you have the right now to be free, to live free. You have divine power, divine promises, and you have a divine life. Now use that also to set others free through my name, through my power, for my glory. You might not know, but as long as they're not saved, my friends, they are perishing. They might be perishing. They might be the nicest person. They might have the most amounts of money. They might live in the nicest houses that impresses your outside appearance. But on the inside, they're drying up like dead men's bones. We have to be responsible for the gospel. This vision, when we were told to hold forth the word of life was because Jesus said, my heart is for the perishing, like you, Art Sepulveda, like you, whatever your name is. I know, only God knows what's going on inside them. And he is ready to rescue when you and I pick up our responsibility. It's beautiful to know that we have a right to live the divine life. It's even more wonderful to carry the heart of God toward the perishing men and women that we may, that while we're involved with. That, my friends, is the vision of the house. That is why we do G12. That is why we have life groups. That is why it's not a program. It's a life. It's the life of Jesus. And we'll go to any lengths. That's why I challenge you to become the responsible Christians that you are to be. Because God knows what he's put on the inside of you. I believe today, maybe you saw just a little bit more of what he wants to do in your life. No matter what you do at the end of the day, at the end of our lives, enjoy the journey. That's what I say. Really, enjoy the journey. But at the end of the day, every breath that you have and every day that you live is about eternity. He said, well, I've already settled it. That's wonderful. What about others? How many know that Jesus did not just come for himself? No, he didn't, did he? He came for us. And God only knows what's inside the people. And you know, the beautiful thing about this is when you and I become the responsible ones and we begin to minister or share the gospel or pray for people, God knows what's on the inside of them. You don't have to carry that burden. You're not, and I'm not the healer. I'm not, you're not the savior. I'm not, you're not the deliverer. He is. He just simply said you do have to go out and preach. And when I say preach, it doesn't mean you have to, could be full-time, but um, every one of us are ministers of the gospel. Wherever God has you, I say, I've been saying it for decades now, I guess. I can literally say that. My gosh. That wherever you are, that's your sphere of influence. Amen. With the love of God. Wow, how powerful is that? Just bow our heads for a moment. <clears throat> Close our eyes. If you're here this morning, maybe... Maybe you never even knew about this divine life. You never quite saw it that way. Maybe you've always had a regard for God and love for God and appreciation for God even. And I believe you did because you're here. So did I. I mean, I, I had appreciation. I, I had a regard and I went to church on Sundays. But one day someone just simply made everything super clear to me. And I realized that I was going to this church building that was using the name of Jesus and the Father and even the Holy Spirit but there was a, a, a lifestyle that I did not have because in reality, my life wasn't changed because I was not born again. I never asked him to come into my heart. I was that whosoever we heard about earlier, that whosoever. I thought I was good because I went to church. I thought I was good because I was, I mean, I was for the most part, I was a pretty good person. I mean, compared to someone else, but you know, but that's how we kind of tend to justify our lives. But do you know that you know that you know that you have his divine life? Can you say with absolute 100% assurity that you have his divine power that has transformed your heart? Are you living that divine life now? And see, that's where Jesus, he is the only one who can change your heart. It's not hoops. 
It's not rituals and routines. Only He can transform your heart. But not if you never make a decision. You might, I liked Jesus for the most part until I ran from Him. I liked Him. I liked the activities that I grew up with, but I never made a decision for Jesus. But I, you could find me in the church almost every Sunday. Is that where you are today? Because he wants to love you. He wants to love you the only way he can, unconditionally and freely. He promises whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Do you have areas in your life that you're not free in? And maybe you didn't tie it back and to your relationship. But I want you to know that here today, there is no question that the gospel is the power to your salvation. Jesus is the one. It's not how many times you go to church or how many things you do right. It's knowing without any doubt. By a conviction. Maybe you don't have the conviction about your salvation. Maybe you need that assurance. Let me pray with you. Maybe you're not sure like I was. Sure that I ever prayed that prayer. Let me pray with you. Or maybe after a season of being up and down, you've come to this church today almost not really knowing why, but you're here. It's because God wanted to speak to you about you making this decision and about how much He loves you and how you can have His divine power and live with His divine promises and live the divine life. That nothing's being held, withheld from you, kept away from you, is a secret to you this morning. He revealed something that the enemy would never want you to understand. That you can live the divine life on this side of glory. God only knows what's in your heart. And He alone can clean a heart. He alone can change the stoniest, hard-hearted, cold-hearted, unforgiving, hating heart and make it soft. And He does it by forgiving us. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed this morning and you're not sure where you stand, let me pray with you. You can make a decision right where you're standing that will change you for eternity. Not because of me per se or because of this building per se, but because of Him. Will you make a decision this morning? This is not up to your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your, your spouse child or your parent this is this is completely a one-on-one -on -one decision God only knows what's in your heart and he's drawing you and he's speaking to you because he's the only one who can cleanse your heart he's the only one who can set that heart free and he does it with love not with condemnation and not with shame and not with guilt And I'm here to share with you that He's given you an invitation to live a transformed life. Heads bowed, eyes closed, hearts are open to Him. Pastor Art, I'm not sure whether I'm born again. Or Pastor Art, I want to rededicate my life. Or Pastor Art, I don't think I've ever made that decision. Or Pastor Art, would you just please pray for me? I think I'm just missing something. I don't even know how to word it, Pastor Art. God knows. Listen and respond to his prompting in your heart. And that's you right now. No one looking around. Heads bowed, eyes closed, hearts open. Say, Pastor, pray for me right where I'm standing, right where I am right now. If that's you, just raise your hand real high. Raise it so I can see it. Unashamed of the gospel. Just raise it. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. You can put your hands down. I want you to, to look up here, if you would, please. You know, the most, the most important decision, you know, you hear me say this all the time if you've been with us, but it's as fresh as, as I've maybe first said it, and that is the most important miracle is this one right here, that one. 
when you make a decision to ask him to come into your heart without question. You know, God only knows. I may see him come up to you or the most spiritual, whomever you think that is, person on the planet come up to you. But God only knows your heart. He knows how to fix it. When you ask for forgiveness, he wipes it away. I mean, your mind can't even catch up to what he can do in your heart. Your mind can't even, it just, no, no it's, it's, you're making it sound too easy. I didn't make it that way. I didn't do anything. I can't do anything. He's the rescuer. Maybe some of you this morning can identify where, where I was. Going to church and showing up. <laughs> Man, just no decision. I mean, the moment I walked out of church, I was like a different person. I mean, you think like, what? And we won't go there. Because that's the old Art Sepulveda. <laughs> but those of you who raised your hand, I am going to pray for you. But I'm going to ask you to do one thing. I will not embarrass you. I will not do anything to draw any attention to you except for one thing. And that is in just a moment. I'm going to give you fair warning. I'm going to ask those of you who raised your hand and wanted to raise your hands to step out near this aisle. When you're, wait, just wait a second. And I'm going to ask you to come down here. And you're not going to face anybody. You're not going to do anything ridiculous. And I'm not going to do anything funny to you. But what I want to do is invite you to come down with that decision you made, if you would, please. And you can come with a friend. If the friend's with you, they'll walk with you. Come on, if you raise your hand, I just ask you to come down here right now. If I can have my life group leaders kind of line themselves up. Just come down, if you would. Just, just welcome them into the kingdom of God. This is an amazing decision. We're going to pray right now. I'll shake all of your hands in just a second, but I just, this is so important for all of us. Above all, I know for some of us that came up, there's a lot of words that were shared. And maybe you're like, I kind of lost sight of all the words. You don't have to remember all the words right now. But I think you can sense what's going on in your heart. And, and I just want you to understand how important you all are. We all are. And, and this decision really is a very powerful decision. Because I know some of you in your, are things are going on in your heart that, gosh, you know, you don't have, uh, you don't have the ability to share with somebody, don't know how to. Some of us regret some things that we've stepped into, done. All of that gets wiped away by the power of His love. And so I just want to pray with you, make it real simple, and. Um, I just ask you to bow your heads up front. For the rest of our audience, we're going to pray together with our friends that came forward. Because this is making a decision. Say this, Heavenly Father, I come before you this morning. And in one form or another, I am that perishing person. I need you, Jesus. I'm not sure about my walk with you about my salvation but right now I open my heart to you and I ask you to change my heart take out the stony heart forgive me for all that I've done I ask for your forgiveness set me free from the things that I have done you said whosoever would come to you in no way will you turn them away but you would receive us you would receive me and cause me by the power of your cross to be saved Jesus I acknowledge you openly here at this altar as my Savior I believe that you alone were the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And right now, I ask you 
send your unconditional love and transform my heart send now your Holy Spirit to live inside of me and by faith I trust you that you love me unconditionally and now because of this prayer before you Lord Jesus I am a new creation in you Lord Jesus all things have passed away all things now become new not because of my works but because of my trust in you thank you Lord Jesus for loving me this I pray to the Heavenly Father in Jesus name amen and amen give the Lord a great big hand clap